Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. You can't really excuse other stuff just because, well, they tried. Listen, man, I, I really like this film. I think this is the last great swashbuckling film. Quite arguably the best filmmaker of our generation. And then they like it and they tell their friends and it kind of balloons from there. But when you're... Do free plugs during the show? Let's do a video game. <laughs> it, it's probably true. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was out at the time, or the movie just didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or maybe what we don't love about it, and decide whether the movie is worth a revisit. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast. So this week, we are doing the 2002 summer blockbuster, I say that in air quotes, Reign of Fire. Woo! We're talking dragons. Real quickly, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this movie starred Matthew McConaughey and Christian Bale, and it was about it was a post-apocalyptic world uh, where dragons ruled the world, where they discover a dragon in tw- in present day London. So 2002, the dragon awakes and then there's an opening credit sequence and you find out that the dragon has spawned millions of other dragons and they have all just burned everyone and they eat ash and all that stuff. And this takes place in outside of London. Uh, some, I don't know where in England somewhere. Uh, I thought it was Manchester. Okay. That sounds good. We'll go with that. <laughs> uh, and uh, Christian Bale leads uh, this group of people who are just trying to survive and they are come upon by, Matthew McConaughey and his Kentucky Irregulars, as he, I was jokingly referring to, which he does call himself that. I don't know. They kill a dragon and they just, you know, have to save, save the world. That is a terrible plot synopsis, yeah. but I don't care. Well, you probably have already seen this movie. If you have not seen this movie, please stop the podcast, put it on pause, go watch the movie, and then come back and we'll spoil it for you because we don't have any interest in not spoiling things. We're talking about the movie. I mean, that's yeah, you, you kinda, why you came here. I, I'm being facetious, but yes, that's what we're talking about. It We're going to do that. Oh. So uh, real quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll break down the facts as I, apparently I've been, you know, fact guy. That's not I don't want that. Listen, I don't you want that moniker. Trade off. I, you wanted to trade off in season two and then you didn't. I did. I did. And so. Well, because I just don't trust you. I don't you? trust you to bring the facts. Like well, I bring the facts. I bring the facts. Butler. You shouldn't trust me. Damn it. OK, so <laughs> <laughs> as I said, it was released in 2002, July 12th, 2002. And on that very same day, the movies that it was up against was Halloween Resurrection. If you remember that movie, does everyone, do you remember that movie? I do remember that movie. Road to Perdition, which is awesome. I love Road to Perdition. I, uh, as do I. Uh, the Crocodile Hunter Collision Course, which was for kids and will remain for kids. Uh, and I have not seen that. <laughs> uh, but also something to think about is this movie was... I don't want to say I think it was the week after because I think July 3rd was a Wednesday or something like that was July 3rd was MIB 2. So obviously Men in Black was super popular. Mm -hmm. So a sequel is always going to outperform uh, the the original because, you know, everyone's geared up for it. So that's a huge monster right there. And that's very tough to go up against. In your first week when that like I don't even think Rain of Fire. um, Yeah, I think it's opening week. It would it's it came in third behind MIB two and Road to Perdition, uh. So it, it got beat by a. I mean, which is Road to Perdition is not a summer movie, which I I didn't realize that that came out in the summer. That's like a you got November. Hanks. Maybe that's all you need. I guess I mean, but that just that's like a, Road to Perdition is with Tom Hanks and Paul Newman. It's about Irish gangsters. Um, I'll tell you, it would not be a summer movie today. Absolutely not. No, I mean it's a fantastic movie. If if. For some of our younger audiences out there, if you have not experienced Paul Newman in anything he has done, shame. And you should go back and watch a lot of the stuff that he's in because he is fantastic. And the fact that he was in this movie with Tom Hanks is just and Sam Mendes directed this, yep. I believe. And Jude Law's in this as well. And so is uh, Daniel Craig. I yes, Daniel Craig. I mean, there, th- honestly, it's OK, a, 
So we are going to now be doing the 2002 <laughs> movie Road to Perdition starring Tom Hanks. We should actually put that on the on the list because that I can say that's forgotten, right? Do people talk about it that much? I'll tell you, a lot of people my age probably haven't watched it. Oh, man, I just I remember the scene that. when he like blows them all over at the Tommy gun. OK, all right, all right, we're, we're really talking about Rain of Fire. I apologize. So so Rain of Fire was rated PG-13. It's 109 minutes, 60 million dollar budget. It op- it's opening week and it came in, it, it made 15 million. As I told you, it was third behind mentioned uh, men in black too. Uh, it domestically overall made 43 worldwide 82. So obviously it's probably still in the red right now. So I don't think it's ever going to get in the black, even yeah. with uh, DVD sales or Blu-ray sales. I don't even know if it's on Blu-ray. I'm sure it is. We should have looked that up. That's terrible on us. Christian Bale, Matthew McConaughey. They would have released that just as money. Maybe, back. maybe so directed by Rob Bowman, who is, uh, I know him more from uh, all the episodes he did for X Files, right. thirty four of them to be exact. I, I counted them. Well, it was counted for me. Uh, he, but he also did the first X Files movie, which I like, and I like the second one too. So I don't want to hear you. Yeah. Uh, I shut up. It's an episode. Listen, yes, you don't like right. if you don't like. Listen, you need to. You love that. You love the X Files. You then know you I need to the like the movies. It's just it's what it is. It's just what it is. That's not how it works. <laughs> it's not how any of this works. That is how it works here. <laughs> um, he also did Electra, the movie Electra, which. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing no. And back to back with this. So I think that's why he's mostly just, he went back to TV. He does do. He, it. I have that. He did. Uh, he's done some episodes of castle Quantico code black, a lot of, a lot of TV shows, yeah. which is good work. And, and you know, it pays well yeah. and it's, it's steady. That's what I'm looking for. The word I'm looking for screenplay by, I'm going to get these names wrong. Greg Cabot. I would say Cabot. Yeah. And Kevin Paterka. Now that's a screenwriting dude. They did this. They, they wrote the script, which I'm sure. Cause I'm going to, they probably, Bought the script was bought up. They probably wrote it because they have no other credits after this. I did notice that. So then, so then, then Matt Greenberg came in and probably did a polish or a rewrite or whatever. He uh, more recently did the screenplay for they call it Screen Story because it's um, technically it's based on something else. But he did the Pet Cemetery um, remake. Oh, all right. He's also he did fourteen oh eight, which I know we have here, and H really like two O. Oh, she's in that. Jamie Lee Curtis is in H two O Halloween. Oh, the Halloween H two O. Yep. Because Resurrection's the one with Resurrection's the one with uh, Busted Rhymes, right? When they're in Busted the house, Busted, Busted Rhymes. Rhymes. I said Busted Rhymes. I thought you said Busted Rhymes. I was like, nah. why would I say Busted Rhymes? I don't know. Uh, he <laughs> shut up, Busted Rhymes. All right, so I mentioned that Christian Bale is in it. He plays Quinn Abercrombie, uh, the heir to the Abercrombie and Fitch for dumb <laughs> <laughs> Matthew McConaughey plays Denton Van Zan. Already, these two, first two names are like. I, I just picture the, the the two writers getting together. All right, what are these guys called? How about Quinn Abercrombie? Like it's like that is such a movie name. <laughs> and Denton Van Zan, Isabella Skorupko. I said mm, that wrong. I think that yeah. Plays Alex Jensen. I mean, we could have gotten a better name than that, right? We just we just came from Quinn Abercrombie and Denton Van Zan, and now we're going to Alex Jensen. Listen, that's Natalia Romanoff that he's talking. About. <laughs> <Goldeneye>. <laughs> Gerard Butler as Creedy, as I was talking to Mike before. He's clearly called McCready. In the movie, they say his name, but and he's listed as Creedy. And then Alice Krieg as Karen Abercrombie, who was Chris, who was Quinn's mother. And she's only in the beginning. Yeah. The, that is the Borg queen for all those nerds out there. That's right. Also for all those nerds out there, <laughs> Alexander Siddig plays a part of AJ, kind of the guy on the radio. You'll know him as Dr. Bashir from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. We were, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we should have like some kind of alarm sound that's a like watch. nerd alert. Nerd alert! Or Trek watch, yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that a lot in this podcast and pretty much every episode of Crack One Open when I do it, I have like, I point out a Star Trek. It's just what well, I hold do. Hold on. So I wonder if all the movies we have done, and now we are on number 16. If we can find somebody who's it, in Star No, Trek. if you have found a Star Trek, a person who's been in a Star Trek episode, a uh, show, each, uh, each, uh, each movie. I, I wonder. Know. I'd have you, to go back. Yeah. That's definitely like probably half of them. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. When you have eight series and like numerous movies. True. You're True. gonna find somebody. True. All right. So that's it. Those are the facts. That's the cast. We're gonna start getting into it. Mike, did you like it? Because I have really mixed feelings on it. Like I go ahead. I, I all right. I I did like it. I didn't think I would like it this time because when I first saw it, it was two thousand two, so I was like, I think was, So you the first the last time you saw it was in the th- not in the theater, but when it came out. I think I saw it when it came out, and then I think I saw it again. I had rented it, I think. And so this is 2002, so... Yeah, 15, yeah. So I was 15 when I saw this, so it was like a fun... Like, I was a teenager, so like, oh, dragons. Right. You know, the, Matthew Connery's got a giant axe. They're shooting dragons. Like, it, was, <laughs> it was all right. It was an okay time. But, like, this time I was watching it, and I'll tell you this. I tried to get 
my fiance at least to watch this with right. me. I was like, hey, you want to watch it? I don't really feel like watching it like one in the morning. So I was like, let's watch this. And I don't want to be like, alone with the dragons. I, I don't think I know this one. Oh, let me show you a trailer. So I showed her the trailer. And uh, man, this is like probably one of the last movies that had like trailer like in a world taken yeah. over by dragons. And the whole time she's like in the couch, like like going as far into the couch as she could, like with the cringiest face on it. And I'm like, uh, this is something we're watching. Because no, I mean, back then, definitely not. And even now. I don't think I could watch this film. And I'm like, the, uh, the trailer has a very nineties feel to it, even though it's 2002, but you, the decades bleed yeah, into each other, but not, yeah, it's very not, it's not very good. And it's not representative of the movie. either. They make it seem like it's back to back dragon, dragon, dragon. And it really right. wasn't, which I liked when I watched it. I was like, oh, all right. You know, I, I didn't, I don't think I enjoyed it as much as I did when I was 15, but I definitely didn't think I would enjoy it at all this time. <laughs> so I was, I, I did like it. Okay. But I also have mixed feelings. There's a lot to be left to be desired, I guess. Yes, uh, I the lasting image I always have of this movie is him jumping off the smokestack or wherever with the axe. Well, that's because like, the commercials played that up right over constantly. And over. But that it's just it. so hilarious that what are you going to do here? And like, and I'm talking about uh, when Matthew, when excuse me, Denton Van Zandt grabs his battle axe, which is I don't know if that's uh, military issued, and jumps at he, as if he's going to I don't know what to this dragon who just picks him up out of the sky and eats him. That's at the end. It's awesome. Yeah, but it's also awful. And it's also all green screen. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah, so uh that's my lasting image of the movie. Everything else like so as soon as the movie starts, uh I was like, "What?" And that was the pigeon stuff. So, as soon as the movie starts, they do this thing where the pigeons are flapping like you're supposed to think it's dragons, but yep. it's in this slow motion uh they're doing some kind of other special effect to it. It's not like slow-mo, but it's almost like, like stylized slow motion. And then, the, and then mm-hmm. it opens up on London and, and, and he, the kids walking and it was just kind of like, ugh, like I, I did not, I was not a fan of that opening shot. I, I just thought that's pretty representative of the late nineties, early 2000s. No, like you absolutely. gotta have a stylized opening when you have to sit through the credits right that, now. But that, that opening is like, and I'm not I'm not trying to get into the heads of head of Bowman or any anyone who put that together. That opening to me feels like, oh, we gotta open this some way. Let's let's have some kind of like cool way to open. Like it was not it was like an afterthought. Like it was in the in the edit. You know, like it wasn't just I can like, see that you know they never I mean? had a plan on how to just put open. the credits on. Right, right. And because and the other thing with this movie is I didn't realize that the opening credit sequence, like if you don't pay attention to the opening credit sequence, you're missing major plot points. The fact that the dragons eat ash like that's written down like so the, the dragon awakes uh chris uh quinn you know survives mm-hmm. and then it cuts to the credits and it's just kind of like you know all the, it's uh, there has to be like a minute and a half two minute credit and the credits act as an uh prologue to what's happened since the dragon awoke and it's just like if you don't pay attention you don't you don't know that they don't need that they, they eat ash you don't know any of that you don't know like how they, you know, all of a sudden they they use nuclear weapons and they they try to use it, which not for nothing. But if they use nuclear weapons against the dragons, shouldn't half of England be irradiated? Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. They go, they use their biggest weapons. And I'm like, eh, nukes. But they don't in the opening credits. They don't say nukes. They just say use some powerful weapons. It's the cast that says nukes yes. later on. Yeah. So I'm wondering if the writers didn't actually intend for it to be. Uh, the, the Who knows? Writers sort of wrote nukes. I don't know. Who knows? But yeah, I agree. Yeah. 20 years later, they would not have been able to just walk on land and be all right. I just question the use of the opening credits as being a prologue to being having major plot points put in there that you're requiring the audience to pay attention when, let's be honest, people come late to the movies all the time, as we know, working in a theater. People don't really, oh, what I missed, like the first 10 minutes, eh, whatever. Like, so when we were doing us in the opening of us. Oh, yeah, if you missed the first, yeah, beginning of yeah, us. So screwed. people are like, I didn't miss anything. And I would be like, oh, you did. You probably, you probably <laughs> want to wait till the next show. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> but here's the thing. As a filmmaker, you shouldn't be beholden to people coming in late. No, I get like, that. Like, I'm sorry, coming in late to a movie. Like, you want to come, like, during the trailers. All right, you come in late to a movie during, like, an actual showtime. Like, that's scummy. You're, you're, you're scum. <laughs> like, I think, like, don't come late. Don't If you're late, I'm sorry, you missed the movie. If it was a play or a show, they wouldn't let you in. True. Plus, uh, uh, you're, you're good. You're probably a good 10 minutes before they give you the, the history because you got to go through all of Quinn waking up the dragon. That's true, which is like the worst, like safe, like so they go down there and the, the, that guy is complaining about his mother because his mother runs the uh, Karen Abercrombie runs the, the the crew, I guess. Yeah, I think she's a main engineer. And they get into they they dig into the void 
And the kid comes like, what's going on? First of all, you do not have a hard hat on. I mean, I get it. I mean, there's a movie, I suspend my disbelief, but your mother is head of this crew and you're just walking around down there with no hat on, number one. Number two, guy's like, yeah, go on in. Well, go on in. That guy be fired. And she's just like, and then she sees him. She's like, come on. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They all get killed. Take a walk around, Quinn. See what you got there. Go ahead. <laughs> and the, one of the things, so in the beginning, he gets sprayed. Yes. And, and his eyes are red. And it never happens again. Right. I I, I, I couldn't remember because I had obviously had seen this already. I couldn't remember if that was a plot point later on to why he was so he was a quote, a leader or so, you know, somebody who was, I don't know, successful in staying alive because he had the dragon in him. Well, that's the thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, so I thought that that was something and, and it didn't turn out to be anything. I just couldn't remember if blinding people was one of their tactics. But I, I, I do remember that they don't, they don't explain where Quinn came from. Well, I have this in my notes that the reason the method that they have come up with how they mix the two chemicals, which I kind of like, right, is kind of based on the spitting cobra and the bombardier beetle, because that's something that they do. They have two glands, stuff like that. Um, I don't know which writers did that. I would assume <laughs> the originals ha- did that. Well, it's just interesting that, you know, that like, like kind of like a twist on the dragon the lore. And when, right. I like yeah. I like that they were exploring that. And, you know, I actually like the opening with the the pages and stuff like that. I have that in my notes that I like that they explain the backstory in a minute and a half I, so I, that you don't get the actors kind of telling like you always like show don't tell. Sure. Like, sure. Get a minute. Get it out of the way. And this is the story we're focusing on. I don't I, I like that. I do like show don't tell, but I do also understand that you need exposition in something like this as well, because you're setting up the world beforehand. I will say they don't explain the ash thing well enough. I was confused by that. But the rest of it, like how the world got built up and destroyed. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, and I don't understand why they eat ash. I was confused the whole time because they eat people clearly. And dragons because the, the other guy. Dragon, yeah. yeah, the alpha was eating the female dragon. Yeah. So why? I don't why know. They, eat ash? And they never show them eat ash. I don't know. It there's 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 a lot of little things in here that I'm just kind of like what like so for instance when they kill that when they kill that dragon and they leave Van Sant takes his mm-hmm. Kentucky regular yeah, as he the calls them and they leave and then Christian Bale goes to the dead dragon and he pulls out an egg mm-hmm. well, I don't understand well, why 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 do I care now that I I already know we already know why there Van Sant has already broke down why he thinks. What? Why they think the male is the one that pop that goes around and impregnates all the eggs and stuff like right. that, right? So why does Christian Bale pulling the egg out of the dead female mean anything to me? Maybe it's him kind of re- coming to the realization of oh, maybe Van Zant was right. Maybe I should have gone. Like him regretting not maybe taking the fight to the dragons. Sure, having to live the life he's living. Still. Sure, okay. Um, especially now that he gets his quote unquote son back. That didn't. I didn't understand that. They had that. They had that moment. And then right away, a king comes back. Yeah, they had that moment where he's like, oh, I ain't going to stop you. You're a man if you think you can go. And then he's like, sorry. And like then I, and he's like, that's all right. It's like like you're kind of disregarding the moment they had. And he's back now. I almost wonder if in one draft, Jared goes with Van Zandt, gets killed in the um, the attack on his uh, platoon. And then that inspires Christian Bale to just be pissed at the alpha and go back. And then maybe when they rewrote it, they're like, listen, I don't like that the kid dies. <laughs> <laughs> we wrote, all right, but we really like that scene between the two of them. Like, all right, so he comes back right away. Oh, yeah, I like that. That's happy. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I don't, just I don't. to give it a happy ending, maybe. I don't know. I, 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 maybe, maybe what you're saying is probably more accurate. There's probably differences in the script and the revisions. Yeah. Maybe they made changes because I know that they had, they, because they shot this in Ireland. And I guess that was the, f- it was the first outbreak. Of foot and mouth disease, because so that back then the foot and mouth disease was going across Europe, and this was Ireland's first time they've ever had it. So it caused production delays, and they had to not, they couldn't do stuff, they couldn't do certain scenes. They had a, they had to change stuff around. So yeah. I think that affected that. I don't know what exactly it did affected, but if it it does feel like there's there's moments that they set up, obviously with the Jared situation they disregard mm-hmm. because they just come back and and there's moment like in the beginning where the guy that leads them to yeah, I want to go pick the tomatoes. Yeah. And then you you think that that guy's like his major opposition. And then he really doesn't show up later until he gets goes with Van Zandt to go fight the dragons uh, in London. See, I kind of like that. I like that they set him up as like this guy who's really going to go up against him. But it's just people trying to survive and just have differing ideas. I like that because when I started, I was like, oh, man, is this just going to be the typical like power play kind of situation here? But then Christian Bale goes and saves him and he kind of regrets what he did. 
Like he regrets, just did, he regrets just that time regrets going, going in and getting the tomatoes, obviously, and it cost one of his well, other sons. Well, let's be fair. The tomatoes were ripe. So, I mean, you had some point you got to pick them. Right. Well, <laughs> he, did, he didn't want to wait much longer. He wanted right. to wait, what does he say, two more weeks or something like that? I think wait so, Wait till yeah. they germinate so we can get the seeds? Yeah. What are you doing, Eddie? Me and a few others. We're going harvesting, are we? No, you're not. It's not ready. We spoke about this. Half the stuff's not right. You pick it now, it won't germinate. That means no seeds. That means nothing to plant next season. There won't be a next season. We'll be starved to death. What is this? We can do it, Eddie. We decided, all of us, you as well. Dig in. Work together. Outlast them. Kids can't eat hope, Quinn. So it's like, we couldn't wait two more weeks. No one looked like they were starving. <laughs> Everyone looked all right to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Christian Bale's jacked in this movie. Who, Christian Bale? Yeah. Well, you know what's funny about that is that so because we kind of have talked about Van Sant and Matt McConaughey, and that I think we probably need to have a conversation about him as that character. But I guess when Christian Bale lost weight and he was going to because he thought maybe like that, you know, post apocalyptic, you, you don't have very, you don't have a lot of food, you're, you're starving, you're going to be thin. But and then, he's really big on right. making the body changes. Yeah. Absolutely. And then McConaughey showed up. And he was jacked and he was like, <laughs> God damn it. I can't, I can't fight him like this. So he had to go back and bulk up. Go yeah. Bulk up. So yeah. Well, right after this, he did equilibrium where he was pretty. Gunkata. Do you remember that? Do you remember that was called Gunkata? I do. I, I like, <laughs> I like equilibrium. I would be interested to go back and. Okay. Cause I saw that as a teenager. I'd be interested to put that on forgotten cinema to see what. Cause I, think I don't about like equilibrium. You didn't. Well, you were older when you watched it. Yeah. yeah. But there in equilibrium. There is a scene where, and I don't, I probably haven't told you this already. I think we've discussed it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a scene where the, the, in equilibrium, it's like, I don't know. They, they, it's called Gunkata and it's kind of like they shoot the guns, but it's like kind of like a martial arts style format. Uh, they're, killing civilians or something so like one of the guys holds the gun up and it's a cut they cut away they don't show him getting shot but the guy the, the guy he's shooting it's like an extra he holds his hands up and it's like he holds him up like he's got a sun in his eye it's cause, so so instead of like so if somebody pulls a gun on you and you know they're gonna shoot you in the head you're gonna be like no you're gonna scream <laughs> this guy puts his hands up in the way that he's like oh come on man <laughs> no I'm, not in the head i'm gonna die and i remember watching that and i'm in the theater i'm just like what and i turned to whoever it was i go is that real? Did he really do that? It's just so bad. But yeah, I'm not an equilibrium fan. I, I've never was. I I like the gun kind of stuff is cool, but mm -hmm. I was never a fan of the whole thing. I got you. We could put that down. We could, yeah, we I'd go. be interested in revisiting it. And um, then immediately after that, he lost weight for the machinist. Yeah, which is a very good movie. Which, I like that movie a lot. Yeah. He, but he's effed himself up. I don't know why. I just didn't swear. This. He screwed himself up. <laughs> I think he talked about how uh, he like he had to go to the doctor and, and, and the doctor nutritionist and they told him you, you can't keep doing this I mean, yeah 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 because he after the machinist then he had to gain weight for batman begins and the right. way he figured out he didn't used to use the nutritionist right and so for batman begins he just ate bread and carbs because he was like i have to gain 120 pounds now he just ate bread and bread and bread and bread and italian food yeah and like carbs like pasta and then when he got onto the set of batman in the costume he learned he couldn't move for much longer than like 20 <laughs> seconds he had no he might have been big but he had no stamina right so for Dark Knight, he had to be like, all right, I need to like run and <laughs> <laughs> really like not just eat bread. But I know that after Vice, he went to a nutritionist for Vice. OK, because he didn't want he's you know, I'm getting older now. I don't want to die. Well, yeah, he's he put on what, like 60, 70 pounds for yeah, that role. Like yeah, that. yeah. I th but also I think part of the reason this movie is what well, we chose this movie and why people like this movie. Dragons is one thing. Mm, yep. Yeah. And this is before Game of Thrones. So. You know, you didn't have this is the this, this is what right. you got. Or right. Lord of the Rings. Well, this is before. Oh, yeah, you're right. Well, no, this is like during the Lord of the Rings. Probably, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I'm just trying to remember if there was dragons in Lord of the Rings. Was there? There's something like a dragon in Two Towers, but not like oh, the okay. Hobbit. Not like the Hobbit trilogy. Not like right. no, not like right. a classic dragon like in the Hobbit. No, not like Smaug. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so one of the reasons I think this movie is always thought upon well is the the strength of the two leads is christian bale and matthew mcconaughey are really good actors right and not only are they just they're good at their craft they are two people who put themselves completely into their roles to the point where in this movie mcconaughey shows up before he shows up there was this uh they're talking to one of the extras or one of the uh not extras one of the character actors and they were like listen mcconaughey's 15 minutes out when he gets here you can never call him matthew or mr mcconaughey you have to call him by his 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 name Van Sant. Anywhere you see him, outside of, outside of the production, anywhere it's Van Sant. 
I get that because the way he is in this movie is so over the top. Of, I guess over the top American is just ridiculous. And That's like, because he barks, I think some he barks some of his words sometimes. Oh, he absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. In the thing. See, I always I don't like when actors do that. Like, I get you. I don't like being super method. Like Wesley Snipes, call me Blade. I am Blade. Oh boy. But I can see what I would do if I was Matthew McConaughey. I would be like, I don't want anyone to treat me treat me with respect, but I don't want people to like. Uh, maybe call me Van Zant, but I want to be mad the whole time. So maybe I don't want people to talk to me. Maybe I want to be alone. I, I would be like, don't talk to me at all. Okay. To just to put me in a mood where I was like not happy with my situation on set almost, so that I would always be mad and kind of, kind of seem alone because that's his character. Always seems like he's. He's got his crew, but he's always by himself. Like, I'm the person to do this. But, I, like, if you call me McConaughey, you're going to be kicked off set. Like, I, hey, I, Matt. I hate that. <laughs> off, out. Hey, Matt. Got <laughs> a cookie regular. <laughs> you call me Van Zandt. I, I, my, my, name's, my name's Matt Van Zandt. You call me Matthew one more time. <laughs> you're responsible for this place. Who are you? My name's Van Zandt, Kentucky Irregulars. You're a long way from home, Van Zandt. You lost? Rebuilt the National Guard C-5A. Flew it 8,000 miles on two engines and tried to set it down on the old strip outside of Manchester. Lost 122 men and most of my fuel. We need shelter. A place to refit artillery. We'll be out of your hair by 1,800 hours tomorrow. That's a good story. Especially the bit about the plane, but there hasn't been anything in the air for 20 years. That's their territory. That's my territory. That's your territory. They're just written. Well, I can understand. I can, but I can understand how different actors need different ways to keep themselves. And you know this to keep themselves in their roles. You know, Daniel Day Lewis is notorious for becoming his car, his character, his role. He, Fighting people on set. It, but look at the results. I mean, it's there's a difference if it's Daniel Day Lewis is it does all that or Matthew Connie does all that and they're terrible on screen. But it, look at the how look at how they perform. It works for them, not for everybody. Let me ask you. But can Daniel Day Lewis not do that and still deliver a great performance? Can probably he not. He probably doesn't think he can. He probably thinks this is. But this is his method. This is his, there's different acting methods for different people, which I admire because we always talk about or I always talk about at least. The cookie cutter mentality of young actors and actresses that come out of Hollywood. They all act the same. They all do the same. We had this conversation. We're watching X-Men Dark Phoenix. Right. right. They all do the look away when they're trying to get emotional. They all do the look up to the sky and then come back. In the 90s, they always would touch the hair and put the hair behind their their ear or something like that. The fake anger, which you could always tell from any actor or actress. Mm -hmm. When you get this assembly line of actors coming out, actors and actresses coming out, doing the same manners and being taught the same thing. At the end of it, when you're watching it on screen, it does not affect you anyway because you're just seeing seeing well, the everything same you've cues, seen before. Right. Yeah. So I actually, I'm okay with actors doing something different to get themselves into the roles because the proof is in the pudding. These guys are Academy Award winners. They're yeah, not. A, I, you I know what I mean? I, as long as they're not, I, I can never respect an actor who's an asshole to other other people on set. Well, that's different. That's that's something I can't abide. So if if McConaughey wants to be called Vincent, that's fine. But if he then goes, you're fired, or he goes oh. off on that cast member, that's a different story. If he's just like, Absolutely. please call me. No, please call me. Van. I need to really get in the character. And he's kind of okay, like, chill about it in a way. Like, I'm okay with that. But if you're like, Dan Day Lewis, you're punching cast members because you're just like, what'd you say? You know who I am? And like, like Gangs of New York, it's like, uh, hey, but what's, well, I don't care about that. I don't, I don't, that's, <laughs> that's to me is unacceptable. That's David O. Russell level. That's like, not, that's not that. David O. Russell has other issues that. Well, it's like he, he, makes that excuse like oh it's for the artistry like Which is, i don't know I, I agree there's a th there's definitely there's a limit there's, there's a, a line. what i'm saying is there's a line there's a line there's absolutely a line but as an actor i understand that you have right. to do things to get into the role and get geared up and whatever yeah. your process is that's fine but i can never respect an actor who puts himself above like the cast and crew like it's a it's a team effort and if you think sure. you're that much better than everyone else like that's unacceptable. i completely understand that but also he could be like, hey, listen, I'm going to be this movie, but like I want to just be this guy the entire time. Maybe let's be fair. Maybe he was on the set for four weeks. He wasn't. You know, he, you know, he's like, not in a ton of the movies. Right. So yeah. So and he's like, listen, just if you could just make sure you refer to me as my character name, please. That's all. And then the, then the, the the executives are like, 
you better make sure that nobody on that, that. set tells him that. And then, you know, like, hey, listen, guys, don't be like stuff like that. I so get that. Yeah. There, it's also like kind of like you're paying like, you know, a messenger, like kind of like what's the message? Well, I know from like what he does, like charity wise and, oh, yeah. and stuff like that. I know McConaughey is actually a really nice guy in real life. So I, I doubt he really like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bunch of cast I mean, because he is it's just so over the top the in this yeah. movie, which well, is fantastic. Great. Yeah. I mean, the, the human stuff is actually pretty good about the movie. That's why I, when I watched it again, I was like, oh, you know what? I didn't realize there were so little dragons. Like the trailer really makes it seem like it's all oh, straight up action. Right. And it really isn't. No. Which I kind of enjoyed about the movie. I liked seeing how they tried to repair the world. I like Christian Bale kind of becoming this and Creedy kind of running an orphanage in a way. Like I thought that was kind of interesting. So in that scene when they're doing the Star Wars play. That's the one thing. I see, that's what I remember about the movie. Yeah. Not him jumping off. No, I, I remember, remember that. the Star yeah. Wars play. Yeah. The Black Knight stares through the holes in his shiny mask. And he speaks words that burn into our hero's heart forever. I am your father. But in the audience is uh, one of the actors is Jack Gleason, who plays Joffrey in Game of Thrones, which I thought was interesting. But fuck him. He's Joffrey. So I don't care. <laughs> I'm sure he's a wonderful person. But, you know, Joffrey sucks. So but anyway, I'm pretty sure he's going to college for like humanitarian. I'm sure that's good. Like that. I'm sure he's a wonderful person and a great man. <laughs> but a good but fuck Joffrey. <laughs> I remember I remember. Oh, was that the Purple Wedding? Is that what they call that episode? The Purple Wedding yeah. is where he does. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. I was like, yeah, choke on it. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get affected by stories. <laughs> um, the other thing is in the trailer, it says that this is 2084, but right, yes, but it's not. It's, it's 20, not it's in the movie. It said so. In the movie, when does it say it's 2020? When they first come on them in the when we first open on the castle, it's 2020. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, so did somebody not tell the trailer people like what, what's I, going I on think with this so. movie? They were like, in the year 20, like 2080. It's like, no, no. You imagine the, imagine the executive, or the, not even that, the filmmaker watching the trailer. Oh, yeah, the trailer for Arena Fires up. What? No. Rob Bowman goes to the studio. He says, hey, guys, uh, we say 2020 in the movie. No, 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 no. We thought that would be better. The trailer guy says 2084. Which is <laughs> funny because I'm sure. So 2002, it's probably, it's probably film, right? Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. So when they send the trailers out, they're all on film. I they probably didn't want to spend the money to send a new trailer out to fix it because now everything's digital. Oh, we get those revision trailers. Right. All the so time. you'll get a trailer like, you know, for example, because Dr. Sleep just came out. So let's okay. Dr. Sleep one trailer TLR one, because as you know, we both work in a theater, so we both are responsible. For, so uh, you've done it a couple of times, put yeah. a playlist together for a movie, which is just putting the trailers and all that stuff. You'll get the Dr. Sleep trailer one and then. Something either there's a credit wrong or there's a date change or something. They, some, they don't even tell you what it is. You'll get right. a trailer maybe a couple weeks later that says one R, which is one revision or one REV. And you watch it again. You don't notice anything. Right. Different. But that's what something like this would have. They absolutely would have done that. Oh, sure. I'm, eh. No, maybe they don't. Now, I'm saying now I'm saying now if the trailer was wrong, it's easier. It's easier to fix. It. Right. Yeah. I mean, now you don't have trailer voice guy either. So well, he's out there. Somewhere. I think he does honest trailers. Is that the trailer voice? Guy? I, well, I think it's a trailer, a voice, trailer guy. voice guy. I, I kept saying we want to talk about Van Zandt. So he shows up and he's got that chomping cigar. And like, I wouldn't let him in to the to the castle at the end. He's like and, and he gives that like impassioned story about like how I killed this dragon tooth. I, I know how, I know the weakness. They, they can't they can't see in the dusk. And the, and the, what does he say? The uh, twilight, mo- twilight, the morning. Yeah, no, twilight. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And then he's like a party pooper at the end when, when they're all celebrating because they killed the dragon. And he's like, I lost good men. But let's talk about, okay, I'm going to get off fans. Let's talk about the archangels. Who are they? Archangels? Huh? 17 seconds. It's the jump from the chopper. That's their life expectancy. You never thought of giving them parachutes. Their job is to do what exactly? Distract the dragon. Yep. Get him down to ground level. Right. So that Van Zandt can kill the dragon at ground level. Okay. Has it ever worked? Ever? Like, they're all like, their average lifespan is 17 seconds. I don't, I don't want this job. Well, he says he's killed uh, over he's only 20. Killed, did he say 20? Yeah. Uh, okay. That dragon that he kills, he's got the tooth. He killed by himself after his people okay. were dead in the field. The Then they mentioned that as a group, 
uh, the Irregulars have killed 20 <laughs> dragons doing their, their shtick. Kentucky Irregulars. Which is why he wants to rebuild his men, but he's lost so many men, he wants to rebuild them up to 200. Right. Eh, it's okay. I, I don't know. See, I, I was thinking, like, Bale didn't want to let him in. Then he realizes he kills the dragon. He lets him in because they only want to stay a day and then go off to London. Maybe he's thinking, all right, dragon bait. At least take the dragon off of my people's, you know, tail. Which mm-hmm. is probably the only reason he lets him in. I don't think he knew. Obviously, Van Zandt doesn't tell Christian Bale, hey, I'm going to recruit. I'm gonna take you, man. Draft's over. No, you know he's like he's like volunteer portion is over. Now the draft. Give me six guys. Yep. So when he first comes on, one of the things I noticed was the difference in the color palette. And we've talked about this all the time now. Uh, so everything outside is gray. Yep. Okay. And everything inside is warm. And I, I'm I'm only bringing this up because does it seem to you that the, it's like the default filter? that a lot of filmmakers are doing now, not now, but like maybe back then or the, all the movies that we know, like everything, uh, let's just saturate it. Let's make it great. Like that's always like, it seems like that's always the choice to they go do. to. Absolutely. Right. For action movies or post, uh, absolutely post-apocalyptic movies. Everything's got to be desaturated. But then it makes the everything look the same. Like every movie you watch, you're like, oh, it's desaturated. Oh, but the, they, they, they got, and I understand the reasoning to do this for this one because the ash and the dragons and the death. Yeah, for this movie kind of makes sense. But for like, take it another way the marvel movies are always too saturated and that's why it always looks like a marvel movie that's why i hate that because it's well, always have, samey they have a spe- specified color palette they need to follow to uh, make yeah. them all the same universe and yes but, i get that yeah make, making everything the same color palette kind of makes everything boring no i understand and that's my point with the desaturation in the uh, of 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 the outside in this movie right it seems like every time we get to one of these movies where we're talking on this uh, on this podcast that that's almost like, hey, let's do something to the outside. Okay, let's take all the color out. Like that seems like the default, and I don't understand. Like, when did that happen? Like, when did that all of a sudden like post apocalyptic? You know what? Everything's gray. Like, like I, I, don't know. I, I, I don't know if I necessarily like that anymore. That's what I'm saying. Oh, you're kind of yeah. I can see, especially for this movie, because everything is gray already. Everything's supposed to be ash. Why not make it a warmer color palette? Because you've got your characters can really stand out there in that that gray drab landscape why not make maybe van zandt maybe cover him in ash so he looks great because he's part of the bad world but christian bale can be colored you know you know be a little cleaner wear something with a little color on him to show like the hope that he kind of represents mm-hmm. play around with the themes of your characters more mm-hmm. instead of if you desaturate everything you can't play with you know costume pieces as much in terms of color and stuff like that you're stuck with whatever the cinematographer or the director decides right. is going to be on the screen as a filter right and they talk about like so let's say let's follow the train of thought of how they used nuclear weapons to go after the dragons and they talk about when you know places that have been irradiated or you you have a lot of um radiation in a location that eventually life starts growing right right so get the plot of the new godzilla film (laughs) right but so it's been 18 years Mm -hmm. since you know why should where they are like there's only one spot where they can grow food like i'm sorry but why not have green in the you know what i mean like, well, i think that's not? less because of the nuclear weapons and more because the dragons just kill anything that's fresh so that they can eat that ash i get it which i don't get i don't get either why they eat ash, well, but that's still, fine. this is the second time we brought it up why do they eat the ash again <laughs> like i mean I, dragons aren't real let's put that out there there's no nutritional value in ash well that's they also man. say in these they say they they say in this that it's not the asteroid that wipes out dinosaurs it was dragons I'm, which i'm fine with okay so i'm just but dragons aren't real so i guess whatever you make up with dragons is fine i don't why i i and I, maybe i should have done more research why would you decide like they're gonna eat ash like why is that part of it find they, out <laughs> they probably have this whole paper on like the history of dragons and stuff like that that they they had built up because i can see that this movie it's a standalone, but I can see them wanting to have maybe had like a rain of fire too, or like set it up for sequels or prequels. So I'm sure that they had the writer somewhere. There's like a story Bible with like, okay. Yeah. The history of dragons and why they eat ash. I mean, if you go into like how their glands work to make the fire, you've probably thought up why they eat the ash. Right. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing also is why is the garden so far away? Like, it's far away, right? Yeah, I wondered that at first. And then I thought to myself, when the dragon showed up, once I mentioned eating ash, that's fresh stuff that you can burn to tender and eat. Well, the castle is pretty much like everyone's insular. You can't really see anything inside the castle. Right. So the dragon probably is attracted to that. They're probably hoping a dragon doesn't fly by, 
see that green and then just burn everything. Just burn the green at least. Gotcha. Keep the alive. Well, I will also argue this. You've already you showed us and you when you first introduced Quinn at the in the in the layer, mm-hmm. they're building the piping system, which is to like there's well, it fails to keep everything from catching fire. Right. right. Yeah. So I know it's 2002. I know hydroponics existed. Why not grow everything down? You know, inside the grow grow strawberries or grow whatever tomatoes inside your castle. You also need sunlight. Well, they can, you can just get lights. UV lights. Lights. <laughs> just throw your light bulbs. Incandescent works. <laughs> I'm wondering how. And, and with the truck, it kind of confused me. It was like, all right, the truck they probably don't use that often. But when Van Zant comes in with like five tanks, three Humvees, and a helicopter, an attack helicopter. Where is he getting all this petrol? Where is he getting all? Oh, the fuel? I noticed. I I wondered that too. Like, wh- like he says, like we're low on supplies. Like we don't seem low on supplies. Like, and there's never a talk. E- even on the other side of it, when the cast and they're like, you know, when they're going to get the food, right, and stuff like that. But you guys had no problem making food down. There's no ever talk about we're running out of food because you guys are cooking things up and making vodka. Oh, no, but Eddie says they're starving. Yeah, exactly. So I don't. I don't. It's it's kind of inconsistent. Yeah, and. To your point about the the vehicles that Van Sant has, so they go to London, right? And they're gonna go and they're gonna get to London, and they know that there's dragons in the area. So his tactical move is to drive single file down one road with searchlights on, with, with, yeah, <laughs> making all hell of a noise. That, that it, so I don't understand that mentality. I yeah. mean, maybe it's maybe you're saying like, well, well, he's crazy. He doesn't. Okay, fine, whatever. If that's what you're gonna say, that he's Van Sant's crazy across the right, yeah. But still, you're setting yourself up for, for failure right there. Absolutely. I was thinking, you know, maybe if America wasn't as bad off and they were able to get fueled up right before they left, like there's still a little bit of a military presence in America. But well, then, they're not. Well, you're talking about when they left to go to England. Right. But then, well, they've got their radio station in Manchester and they're not picking up anything from anyone. Although they probably don't have a big tower. So they're talking about they finally hit French people. But, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, I think we always talk about like why. This movie was forgotten. Mm-hmm. I think part of the reason was when it came out, it didn't. It's. I don't know if this is a summer movie. I mean, I guess this is probably more of a September, October movie. See, it's it's definitely a. I mean, it, Men in Black Two killed it immediately. It's a February, March, yeah, September, late August summer movie. Now, sure. Then I don't. I, I don't know. It's. It's kind. It's kind of you know, night like in late nineties, early two thousands. I could see this. You would think it might do well in the summer. Maybe push it to August, yeah, early August. Maybe I'm looking back with kind of like my my goggles are like obviously based on every all the all movies now, like how they're right. Being, it, it's know, tough to like remember yeah. like what came out like Independence Day, right? Um, Godzilla. You know, the Jurassic Park, The Lost hold World. On, it's hold like on. are you talking about ninety eight Godzilla? Right, like, well, right, pe- people put these. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying people put these out, and they yeah, they yeah. have giant monsters or dinosaurs. Understand? Like, yeah, dinosaurs or monsters do that's really well. Who put that's big fair. lizard in the summertime? It's gonna make some money. Yeah, that's fair. But like this, but so when it when when it came out, probably was against it. The fact that it got mixed reviews is also something that kind of like it takes a hit, you know, because because we're talking about it right now and we're back and forth on it. And I think part of the reason why you have mixed reviews is what we keep referencing is I, there's probably a problem in the script. There's, there's too probably many inconsistencies. Right. I, and I, I don't know if that's from having somebody come in and rewrite it or just the production delays because of the foot and mouth disease outbreak or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I think what we, the, the things that we keep talking about, how we're, we're like, we remember has to do with the two leads has to do with their performance. Cause I mean, I know that Gerard Butler's in this, but he is really just, he's his buddy. This is, this is pre 300 Gerard. Butler. Right. So oh no, absolutely. Like, I actually don't mind. Like he does movies where I'm just like Geostorm. Like it's so ridiculous, but he's actually good. I like Gerard he's got, Butler. He's got, like, so you're like, just, yeah. Charisma. Yeah. Like he's almost like somebody, he needs a, a role. He needs like, I know that they did the angels fallen has come out. So he's had those three. Those right. Three yeah. Movies, but like, he needs something like, I don't want to say Indiana Jones, but he's something like that. Something where he encompasses that character. It's him. You can't see it. He's the perfect person for that character and have his own franchise. He Absolutely, needs something yeah. like that. Because I think he could pull that off because he's he's good as well. So I don't mind watching Geostorm. Because I'm not saying Geostorm's great. I just you don't. watch it because he's like, he is like, yeah, he's like leading you through it. And you're like, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm good. I'm good. Like, that's why Olympus has fallen. I liked I, I London has fallen. It was okay. It wasn't great. London Fallen doesn't has a little bit too much CG, whereas the first Agreed. one kind of was like 
not John Wick level, but like it was, oh, oh. Well, Lips has, fallen, fighting, has, like, Lips has fallen has the plane that's coming in and like shooting everybody. Right. right. It's yeah, got that yeah. scene. You're like, ooh. But then you've also got him in the White House, like just beating the crap out of people. And then well, London has fallen has these big action sequences in the streets where you're clearly it's CGI bullets and stuff like that. Well, you're Angel like, has fallen mm-hmm. looks like they've gone back to what like Olympus has fallen was. Right. It's, it's more like personal. personal story. Yeah. yeah. So which, which I'm, I'm good with. I don't know yeah. how we got onto this, but yeah, that's I'm good with that. So. Did you kind of notice like the King Arthur kind of themology yep. throughout the whole uh, story? You're talking about when what's his face? They took they called uh, they bring it up, don't they? They they do make a couple of references. Well, he's in a castle, so you gotta right, right, yeah. Right. But I, I like the whole after they bring that up, I'm like thinking about. It, I'm like, wait, is this all supposed to kind of be? Because you got Van Zant is kind of like Lancelot. He comes in, he's got a lot of charisma. Christian Bale kind of trusts him. He's like, ooh, okay. He's this warrior who then kind of turns around and kind of tries to take the kingdom from him, kind of eh, not so much on purpose, just like, hey, I have this mission. And then he kind of almost loses his kingdom and then he kind of comes back, Christian Bale, and then it's still everything still kind of crumbles like around him. It's right. got to be rebuilt by someone else. It's very similar to like the original Morta Arthur story. And I, while I'm watching, I'm like, oh, OK, that's kind of why I got a little more into it this time is looking at it from like, cause I think I, I mentioned before, I'm always looking like, what's the theme? And I love when people like yeah. throw in older stories and stuff like that was like myths and legends and like all right let me play on this a theme but i thought that was interesting i didn't know if you maybe caught on to that yeah i remember they referenced uh, when did they reference it didn't they bring it up am i thinking of a different maybe i'm thinking of a movie i saw they bring up like king arthur in your castle or something like that like they just kind of say it it's like a throw oh okay okay because i did just watch the kid who would be king (laughs) so that might be maybe that that, yeah that might be where i was thinking that but no yeah I, i i i got that sense that you're talking about absolutely I mean, I know we keep talking about the script, but I think the fact that it's simple, it's a s- simple story. And I say that in a good way. Right. I think that helps it, which I think, which is why you don't like that minute and a half sequence. But I think because they do I that, just, just, you get a simple story. Cause it's like, we only want to tell one story within this universe. I want to explain this universe really quick. And I want to tell this story. I don't like the intent. No, excuse me. I like the intent of the opening sequence, the, the credit stuff. I don't like the execution. That's probably what I'm saying. I don't I get that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm really OK with exposition dialogue if it's interesting just for the sake of argument. Let's say you have you you cast like a John Hurt in this movie or you cast an older actor, an older English established actor. And he sits there in front of the camera for two minutes and talks to Christian Bale about what's ha- what's what happened. I'm OK with that. I used to own the museum <laughs> and. We had all these pages and tomes of these knights <laughs> fighting these dragons. And what's wrong with that? That's like in yeah. Wayne's world. It's <laughs> like in Wayne's world too. When they have the, the he stops at the gas station. Oh, yep. And it's, Can we do something better? <laughs> Charlton Heston comes on. Like I'm okay with that. But um, yeah. So I, I just don't like the the execution, and maybe it's because it's '90s. It feels very '90s, like the trailer did, like the opening pigeon right. shot did. Yep. And it, it, that's a part of that time frame of of filmmaking where it's not aesthetically pleasing to me or i'm just kind of like eh, it's dated maybe maybe it's, that's it's definitely it. dated yeah but one of the things that it's kind of dated but i kind of like when the well like stuff like when the chopper comes up anything like with the helicopter and the, like the chopper comes up and um she says goodbye to christian bell's character oh you mean like when she like, like nods does, the yeah helicopter? yeah i like that I, that is a little cheesy but that it's an actual helicopter because now it would everything, all that helicopter sequence would all be CG, including the helicopter, everything about it. And I would just be like, come on. But in this, it was like, I don't think there was enough practical dragon. I think I would have liked some practical dragon a little bit. But the helicopter stuff was real. Those guys jumping out of the helicopter, that was like probably real skydivers that they filmed. Okay. So stuff like that I appreciate, which nowadays, other than maybe Mission Impossible throwing Tom Cruise out of a helicopter. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, nothing. Which is the, th- the thing. It's like most people be like, all right, let's, let's CGI it, save some money. Like you can tell things, especially like a helicopter, like when it's CG, because it's like the lighting and stuff never matches unless you're really putting a, a ton and ton of money on it, which this movie didn't have a ton of money put into it. Yeah, well, they don't make 20 to 80 million dollar movies anymore, which we discussed as yeah, well. Yeah, they just don't make those movies anymore. So it's like I, I appreciated the fact that, oh, man, that's a real helicopter. That's an actual pilot nodding the plane, going back and forth. Sure. Like, I like that. Um. The CG also might not be as good as it is now. Obviously, that's saying something it's, that we all it's, know. It's still not good enough. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, even now I'd be like, all right, that's a CG helicopter. I wouldn't have. That scene would have come off as worse to me now. Like, it's a little hokey to have her bow the helicopter and get out. But doing that now with the CG helicopter, I'd been like, 
like my eyes would have rolled. Uh, I would have gotten up. I would have gotten like a soda out of my fridge while she was doing that. I'd been like, I haven't Do you want me to pause it? No, I'm good. I love that. You <laughs> yeah. know, like when you're watching yep, a movie. Don't care. My wife and I are watching a movie. I'm just like, I'm going to get something to drink. Want me to pause it? I'm just like, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things I always talk about is how they introduce in movies. Wait, I know you're laughing. So. <laughs> no, we're good. Don't bother. Yeah, don't bother. Um, so when you're watching a movie and they introduce something shot wise or technique wise that you don't see, I don't like that. So, uh, and I, so an hour and 23 minutes into the movie, we get dragon POV, right? Am I wrong? I thought they did it. Did they do briefly it briefly when he's attacking the, um, oh, shoot, the right. people in the farm? Right. So you're right. Never mind. I don't like dragon POV. How about that? I also don't like dragon okay. POV. Yeah. Oh, he's got great vision in the day, yeah. even better at night. That's when I had an epiphany. You see, they have great vision in the day. They have even better vision at night. But in the failing light, they can't focus. That's blurry as shit during the day. What are you talking about? He looks like he's got the predator mask on. Yeah, like <laughs> rub your eyes, dragon. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't a fan of POV. I, I, you don't need that. There's nothing wrong. I don't need to see the dragon's the bad guy, right? For the for like one of the quote unquote bad guy. I don't. I don't need it from his point of view. You, I don't need to be sympathetic to the dragon's need to burn people <laughs> and eat ash. So I don't need his POV. Just man against dragon. That's all. I, that's what I'm here for. That's like Godzilla. I am here. I'm honestly here for just Godzilla. <laughs> you know, if you just gave me a 40 minute movie of just Godzilla killing things, I'm good. I don't yeah. need everyone else. I, I, I get it. You want to have the human element so we can all connect. But honestly, nobody cares about the people in Godzilla. They just care about Godzilla fighting monsters. Well, they want to repeat the success of the very original Godzilla where sure. like the human story was what mattered in the original Godzilla. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. So <laughs> it's, it's tough to replicate that. Right. In Reign of Fire, I care about only the dragons versus the humans. I don't want to hear see the POV. I just I don't like that. I, and that seems again, that seems like, oh, we gotta do something. No, we don't need to do something. We don't do a shot for the dragon's perspective while he's looking at these people. <laughs> Let's do a far shot. All right. And I realize that these are all probably more like opinionated stylistic choices that I would make as a filmmaker. I get that. I'm not I'm not trying to say that you're wrong, Mr. Bowman, for doing it that way. I just don't know if I would do it that way. That's all. It's just a choice. That's the director of 34 episodes of the X-Files. I love you the X-Files and I love, I love I love everything that he I love all the oh, I actually was going through the episodes he had done. I was like, yeah, right. I'm good. I like Rob Bowman. I, I'm just, you know, speaking of scenes that don't look well or don't like kind of match up. Were you also kind of taken aback between the and I know we talk about the desaturation, but did even the also the grittiness and desaturation of the scene where they're about to run into the tunnel in London. And then when they get into the tunnel in London. Okay. So when they're on the outside on the water, they're outside on the water, they get in, they run across this like gravel, like what looked used to be like a gravel pit. You see the dragon POV again. It was like, all right, whatever. And they go into the tunnel and it cuts. And all of a sudden the grit goes away. Like the, the oh, graininess they had in the film stock that. goes away and it's just smooth. Really? And it's blacks and oranges and reds, mm -hmm. which is fine. It, it's the tunnel, so you don't have to have that grays. But the grittiness goes away as well as the desaturation. And I just kind of like, what? Uh, like, rub my eyes. Like, what just happened? Maybe they got a new camera stock that day. It's, it's kind of like in the episode we were doing, where we talked about Collateral, where it went from digital, and now all of a sudden they're in the yeah. club and it's filmed. Club fever, yep. Yeah. Um, I, that was uh, even more glaring this time. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't get... Yeah, what did they change film stock or maybe lens? I just it was really like a glaring like what just happened or am I watching a different film all of a sudden? I thought that was a little strange. When they get to London, it's just kind of like trying to end the get movie. to the end. Yeah, it's like get to the end because they get to London and like he they're in the same tunnel he was in and he remembers and it looks the same and yeah, like I know this this city inside and out. Yeah, how like, you when was been that? Here years. Exactly. When did, when did we get that set up? Yeah, you know that you've known you. I mean, I it just. Yeah. And then when they have the flashback, when he gets there and he flashes back to the, we already know. Yeah. But I'm kind of, I kind of like Van Zant looking down at him and going, use it. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of like that. Oh. He's just like, snap out of it. This is not what we're here for. I'm a Kentucky irregular. It's almost like we're kind of like Van Zant at that, Van Zant at that point. It's like, we don't need the flashback. And then he just kind of snaps down and goes, hey, use it. <laughs> Speaking of Van Zant, like when he, after, so when he leaves and he's like, yeah, he's, and Quinn is like, he's just going to lead the dragon back to us. And, 
It does. <laughs> it does. They don't explain why, but like or how, but regardless, it does. And then he comes back. He's just like, you were right. How about a sorry? How about you start off with, I'm sorry. And he's just like, you were right. Well, that's not his character. <laughs> I know. He's just he's an <laughs> asshole to the end. Yep. What's the line that we talked that you said Gerard Butler said when, uh, no, oh, one. uh, only thing worse than, worse than dragons, America. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's not untrue. <laughs> And speak for yourself. I'm a, I'm a Kentucky regular. <laughs> That's right. Killed a dragon in the wheat field. That's right. Went up from behind him. It was dusk. He got good vision during I, the day. I just when when Alex tells him about the archangels' life expectancy is 17, and she says it in front of him, "17 seconds life expectancy." I want one of the archangels to be like, "What? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! You said no one's ever like. Well, you said you only lost one guy." <laughs> Alex is the keeper of the dead. He's going to make a wall of these when we're all done. Stop partying, motherfuckers. <laughs> you disgust me. Who wants to join my team? Now, now I'm kind of <laughs> now I'm kind of upset that the dragon ate Van Sant. I could have I could have done with a sequel with just Van Sant going back home. Oh, oh absolutely. That would have been great. Yeah. Going back home and like just killing dragons in the wheat fields of Kentucky. Do they have wheat fields in Kentucky? Oh, that's Let's a, just according to him. Joe. And he's just running around with his battle axe, just running after dragons. Like they're flying. He's like, I got him. <laughs> he's just running after him, like, <laughs> jumping and like slashing their tails off. Jumping Where's that movie? A, jumping from a farm right, side. So we're going to write the prequel to this, and it's going to be with Van Sant. <laughs> we're going to get Magane, who's in his, what, 50s now? He's coming back. Yeah, he can still get ripped. He was a magic Mike. He was that's ripped. fine. That's fine. That's true. That's true. Well, that's what we're doing. We're doing the prequel. All right. You ready for start of fire? <laughs> we br- I don't have anything else unless you got stuff to. I just have two little nitpicks. Go, go, things. go so for it. I'm sure. I'll, you there... know what? As you nitpick, I'm sure my nitpicks will come back. <laughs> I, can find I know one line comes up toward the end, and that is he's playing hide and seek with us. And they go, no, it's more like cat and mouse. Same fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> then they say something else where it's like, I don't, I don't think I wrote down the note, but it, the line something like, He's toying with us. No, he's playing with us. It's like, it's the same thing. Who's, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, like, both times it's just like, what? Yeah, it doesn't seem. Hide and seek is cat and mouse. What are you talking about? And that goes, that goes towards the script or, or goes towards maybe not the script, but like actors making changes or directors making changes while you're shooting. Say this, you know, like something like that. If I, if I, was, I was like, no, can I not? I'd be like, well, we're up. Hold on, hold on. It's not cat and mouse. It's hide and seek. It's, it's the same thing, man. Can we just say it's yeah. playing cat and mouse? Just I don't want to say this line. That's why I, lo- I love I love the Coen brothers so much because their scripts are what you say, and they've gone over it countless times. And they they not that like say my words, f you, you can say my words, right? But like their scripts are they've already worked on all that stuff. And right. There's certain ways you need to say things. When an actor walks in, I'm and I'm I don't know. You could probably speak this more than me. When you have a script and you go through it. Is there some, at some point, do you have, do you build confidence in the fact like, wow, this is really, I don't need to do anything. Like, I don't need to change things. Like, I, I, I only know from writing the script, that side of it. If, so if you get a Coen Brothers script, let's, let's okay. say, you know, or, and you're in a Coen Brothers, uh, you know what, let's pretend you're, you're a Coen Brothers you're doing whatever right. they're saying, you're doing whatever they're, you're saying. But like, is there some level where you don't think that you need to change things, like to make it your own? I mean, yeah, there's some dialogue that I'm just, I, I would just say, you know, when you're doing a script or not, when I do a script, I say it over and over and over and you're over. When you write a comes, script. When I'm, no, when I'm acting and I'm, I'm trying okay. to memorize the script, right, right. read it over. I'm going to say this, say the lines over and over and over until I can say them naturally. But sometimes, you know, sometimes you'll get lines that are like harder than others. Right. And other times you just get it. And it's like, yeah, it's sometimes you'll see a sentence or you'll read a sentence and it just clicks. It's like, yeah, it's exactly how I'd say it. And other times you really have to work on it. Mm-hmm. And you have to say it over and over to make it sound natural, or you do have to change it a, just ever so slightly, like put a contraction where they didn't put a contraction in, or or sure. just kind of like combine two sentences to make it more make it flow like you're actually a human being and not just reading. Because like I I've mentioned before, that's the worst thing I hate when an actor doesn't do that. It's like they're reading off a teleprompter. What's that? When they it, it they seems like it what they're own. saying is yeah they don't make it their own, right. and it just seems like they're just saying the script and they don't have that kind of focus because they don't, I don't, they don't trust the material. That's what it seems That's what like. I'm saying. Like, do you ever so, have a level of comfortability with the script where you come in? Like, even if you don't understand why you're saying something right off the bat, you know that, okay, but obviously this is for a reason I need to do this. Right. There's some, like some parts of the dialogue where I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't like, I'm reading, I'm like, eh, and then I say it and I'm like, Oh, I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Like 
this really gets the point across. Like um, when I did the stage play for Woman in Black, yeah. Um, there's some stuff where it's like the main character when he's it's a two player, uh, an actor plays all the different roles. When he starts off and he's he's really exuberant, and he's talking really fast. When you're reading it on the page, it's like eh, I don't know, but then you say it and it flows so well, and it's like oh, I don't know if I'm going to memorize this. This is kind of hokey. And then he's saying it, it's just like natural speak because it's just written sure the way it should be written. So the reason why we're bringing this up is because of with in, rest, in regards to Rain of Fire, maybe that's not really the actors going in didn't have that confidence with the script, it's, it's and possible. so they or, or you know they're just saying, hey, let me try this, you know, like that kind of thing. Let me play with something that didn't work, I and mean, it's right, and they're taking it, and it's not, it's kind of like contradicting other things. I mean, this happens. This happens in every. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And I think that. And this, it didn't seem to work a lot because it was you're coming up with nitpicks because it doesn't make any sense with the dialogue. Yeah, it's just like I hate like, oh, no, it's not this. It's that it's like it's trying to be a line like it's mm-hmm. trying to be like, oh, we can definitely use that. Like, oh, yeah, it's catchy. Sure. It's not. Well, there's because there's a moment in this where like so they do the triangular thing where they're putting down oh, triangulate these, where the dragon is. OK. Right. And so Quinn goes on horseback to go get it. But Van Zandt doesn't know he's on horseback. But Van Zandt says to him in the in the vehicle, you and that horse flesh are going to play bait. And he tells him, he gives him that line that he's yeah, on horseback. Yep. Like, How do you know? Yep. I was thinking the same thing. Are you just calling him horse flesh? Or? Right. So clearly, you know, that's all. Oh, yeah, he's on horseback. OK, I'm going to try this line. And it's so, yeah. So I think. And the, the computer system automatically then labels him as uh, Quinn instead of the dead guy. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> uh, hang on, man. Who's on that? Who's taking this? Uh, tra- oh, let me write his name in this. So we know exactly. Thank okay, you. we got we don't have time for this. This is my one job. I'm sorry. Is there two ends in Quinn or one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he puts two. So there's two. ends in this Quinn. <laughs> so. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's just my last nitpicky thing. I just had to throw it out because it bothered me so much. I even told like. My girlfriend woke up this morning. She was like, well, what do you think of the movie? I was like, well, there's two lines. <laughs> That's my first thing. I oh, man, there's stuff. I'll, there's movies that I love. And there's moments or lines where I would be like, oh, no. I <laughs> always say this one in Air Force One. I love Air Force Air One. Air Force One is great. I love it. I don't. <laughs> I just don't love it. But when the woman that gets off the plane and she's in, I know you're going to, uh, she's in the parachute. The woman that oh, helped her. The one that becomes the. The woman that helps him fax. And he's like, I'll make you postmaster general. Yep. And then she's not, and they're and the plane's going off of there, and she's all like, "Yay!" She's <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, "What?" Yeah. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so and I love Air Force. So I love get off my plane. I don't, I don't care. That's classic Harrison Ford. I, I don't, I don't care if you don't like that movie. I love that. Who movie. doesn't like Air Force One? I saw people that are just kind of like, "Go," oh, because there's there is a contingent of people out there, Butler, who don't like the Harrison Ford finger act, the point, the finger point acting. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, but that's him. Uh, if you don't like anything about if there's something you don't like about Harrison Ford, you can get off this podcast <laughs> right now. Just just stop. Just turn off this podcast and walk away. <laughs> well, hold on. You don't like what lies beneath and he's in that. But I don't not like him. True. I really don't like that movie. I'm I know. So, well, sorry, we're going to at some point do that movie here. I know. But anyways, <laughs> so th- there are my point was that there are moments in movies that I really love that there are little segments. You're just kind of like, no, yep. I'm not a fan of that choice. And like in Saving Private Ryan. In Saving Private Ryan, I have a real problem. Oh, yep. I know what you're going to go with. I have a when, and I don't remember any of the characters' names right now, but so what's his face? Plays the uh, the soldier who who's fighting the, the German, and he stabs him, and this is at the end, and yeah. he gets stabbed, and the other guy who's, oh, man, I can't remember his actor's name. Jeremy Davis plays the, he's supposed to help him. Right. And he just watches him die. And then later on, uh, they capture that German. And they have, and it's basically they've surrendered, and Jeremy Davies shoots him, kills him, right, executes him, and there's a moment where they they bring the camera comes down and it shows Jeremy Davies with the sun behind him, and it's a hero shot, and to me that is not a hero moment, just because of the fact that he he was too afraid to save his the other guy before the soldier before, yep, and even if you didn't have that part. He straight up executed a dude who surrendered. It's not. Yeah, it's not a brave. It's not a moment of bravery. Right. And I don't like that shot. And I love Steven Spielberg. And right. I have never. And, and if he sat me down and was like, listen, this is why I did that shot. I'd be like, OK, because I'm only coming at it from a from a from an audience member. From your own opinion. Right. Yeah. And to me, that's a hero shot. And he is not heroic in that shot. I, if, I, if I nothing heroic about that, that moment. And but I love that movie. But that moment I don't like. 
Understood. So that, so are there like my point is yes, there are things that you can always find in something. <laughs> but even in like Rain of Fire and the opposite of that, you know, there's stuff that we're talking about how like eh, it's this, we don't like this, we don't like that. But I still love Van Sant jumping from that smokestack. It's a good with shot. an axe in his hand trying to trying to I don't know chop a dragon's head off. And the dragon's like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great plan. But was that his plan the whole time? Is I'm going to jump on this dragon? Like, I just, I, that's, I no, 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 no. Because he fired the, he fires the, the tipped uh, arrow. Yeah. And it just blows off. He's like, ah, fuck it. And then he just cracks the axe like, jump. Get down the ladder. You still got Christian Bale with another one. Right. He was supposed to also be there. If, if he failed, Chris, he was supposed to chop it after Christian Bale, I thought. Like he goes I, I don't know. That was not the it's point. A good the, shot, the, that whatever. was not the yeah. plan. Yeah. I don't, I, honestly, I don't think there was a plan. There was just, let's shoot these arrows and kill them. Yeah. But I mean, overall, the character moments were were good. They they were they were what kind of saved the movie for me in in terms of like the actors rewatching it. The characters, yeah, right. the characters, the actors, the the dragons are cool. The, some of the some of the stuff. There's not really. I mean, yes, agreed. I think it's 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 also so different. It's such a different movie, right? It's something like it's a it's a it was a brave choice to put sure you know sixty million eighty million dollars into a movie like this. Yeah, and, and the summer <laughs> and the summer season is notoriously for sequels so right. i mean you, you i mean it opened up against a sequel halloween resurrection and men in black 2 or before so it's so i guess my point of like is it a summer movie uh, maybe it is because they were like there's no other movies out there like this let's do this and that's fine it's just it's a different movie it's it's definitely any movie's worth going back to if it's not you know trash and this isn't trash no it's yeah. got stuff to like about it. it's enjoyable it's quick yeah yeah that's another thing 109 minutes that's a nice length it's not anything that's going to like keep you there forever. It it moves. Like I went up, I had to go, you know, use the facilities. I paused it and I was already 40 minutes you. in and I was like, oh, wow. 40 minutes in. You watched this in one sitting. I did. I forgot. Well, I I'm did. doing sitting watches. That's I did. Right. Mike one watched this in one sitting. sitting. One sitting. Started about 1030 at night. And I usually fade like 1130, but I did not fade. I, got I need to it. get like a sound effect like confetti and streamers coming down Whee! every time you do like one I one made it. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I did. That's good. I mean, if it's because an action movie, it's probably why. It's got, yeah. But yeah. So, so, hey, check it out if you haven't. Revisit, yes. Share with friends. <laughs> Is it great? Perfect? No. Yeah. No, absolutely not. But speaking of sharing, share this podcast. Ooh. Rate and review, please. Uh, so, we're Forgotten Cinema. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. And Google Play. Mm -hmm. We're also on our Forgotten Cinema Podcast dot com, which is where I usually link a lot of the episodes to. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So please feel free to follow, comment. Uh, we'll respond back. Suggest a movie, even. Yeah, absolutely. You can go. You can suggest a movie on any of those formats. You can also suggest a movie through our contact page, which is on the website. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, we'll uh, we'll take we'll take suggestions. We've got a, like I said, well, I think. We keep adding to the list. So I think the list has grown now. All right. We're never going to stop. No, I know. <laughs> so we've got a new episode every Wednesday. But, okay. uh, you know, please give us a listen. Share with your friends. Tell them, hey, these idiots don't know what they're talking about. That's <laughs> fine, too. Maybe we don't know what we're talking about. But, I mean, I disagree. Uh, so now it's uh, I'm going to start off and um, do some personal plugs. Uh, I will be you know, one man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I've got two books out right now. Uh, Adam Parker and the Radioactive Scout and Adam Parker and the High School Bully. Please feel free to purchase those on Amazon.com <laughs> and ebook or paperback. And uh, I, I know I've already talked about like stuff I'm working on. I'm working on that short story, but I think now um, I, I think I'm going to write uh, not a YA book, but a, a book. I'm going to write a book about Adam Parker as a kid told from the viewpoint of Kevin. Okay. So I think I'm, it's, but it's, so it's going to be like a kid book, like kind of like one of those chapter books. Back so when he was still like into being right. Well, do you remember the script I wrote? Remember the Max Fleming saves the day script, which is pretty yes. much the same thing. I, I actually really enjoyed that script a lot. I'm going to take I think I'm going to take that script and make that Parker. But see, that's the thing. It's got to take place in the early. I always 90s. thought that was your proto Parker. I think it was. And then I did the Parker books and okay. then they were, they were so different and I didn't want to combine the worlds. But I think I might. I think I just might make him Parker now. Gotcha. And just kind of keep it as a as a kid thing. Uh, so yeah, so I'm kind of working on, on, I'm germinating that I'm giving it two weeks to germinate, like I'm going to fire and do that. But, uh, yeah, that's what I'm working on. So, uh, Mike, talk about your podcast. All right. I've got two other podcasts. I've got two player bros that I do with my brother, Alex, where you can join us while we talk about all things video games done in the format of kind of the old video game magazines of yesteryear. Got cracking one open that, uh, with Mike and Elise that I do with my fiance, Elise. 
where we crack open a different craft beer every episode. We talk brews, news, and pop culture reviews. We talk about where the beer is from, the type of beer, uh, history of the brewery, kind of the art on the bottle, because I think that's very important nowadays in terms of, of getting your brand across. And then we talk about what's up in pop culture, usually what's streaming on Netflix, what's out in the movies now, instead of, you know, back then, like we do now. <laughs> so if you want to hear me talk about more my thoughts on more modern things, Crack One Opens where you go. If yeah, we don't talk about modern things here. We kind of give our little. Oh, wait, don't, do you have that memorized or do you have that on your screen right now? Are you I reading just that? kind of just say it every nice, time. Nice, nice, nice. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's Two Player Bros and Kraken One Open. Both of those podcasts can be found wherever podcasts can be found. But also Forgotten Cinema. Forgotten I cinema feel like you right forget right. about Forgotten Cinema. You know, I'm just not. I don't know. I gotta listen to some of these other podcasts. I do listen. I do listen. I plug Forgotten Cinema in every one of my. I podcasts. know you do. I know you do, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, so uh, oh hey guys, I did a hey guys. Do hey not, guys, do not use that. I'm using it. I swear to God, that's fine. <laughs> I don't care. So uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. Share, review, rate, right? Subscribe. Subscribe. That's it. That's the one. Join us next week when we talk about the 1998 action-adventure film The Mask of Zorro, directed by Martin Campbell, starring Antonio Banderas, Anthony Hopkins, and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Don De La Vega. Is that right? (laughs) That is right. (laughs) Also one of my favorite movies. Action-adventure. I don't care. Save it for the cast next week. (laughs) So I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And your list, you... Yeah, he's got it going. Yeah, Here we go again. Here we go. Take two. So I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And you're listening? No. I'm using all of these in the end. Uh, come on, man. It's like, <laughs> like an hour and a half episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Third time. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And you've listened? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. You know what? I'm reading the opening. That's why. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. This has been Forgotten Cinema. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Cancel. <laughs> you have a beautiful voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we dragons love to sing when we're happy. Well, you're not like a dragon at all. Mm. Well, how many dragons do you know? Well, you're the first. You should never listen to minstrel's fancies. A dragon would never hurt a soul unless they try to hurt him first.